We have built the greatest application ever built in the history of politics in the world, bar none. Millions of citizens involved in the 2020 presidential campaign, be they organizers, volunteers, or even just fervent supporters, have downloaded a campaign app, either Vote Joe or Trump 2020. Users give the app their phone number, thereby subscribing them to a stream of texts encouraging them to get more involved. They might give the app access to their contacts, their GPS data, their Bluetooth data. Data and campaigns have always been friends. Where this gets complicated is there's always the question of, is this creepy? Like, is this too much? On the one hand, the tech isn't anything fundamentally new. Apps from Google Maps to Angry Birds to Instagram collect tons of user data, and advertisers have been scooping up as much of it as they can for years. Hyper-targeted ads based on your online and in-person activity are the norm at this point. What's new is that the politicians are catching up to the advertisers. Now we're starting to see this triangulation of computational power with massive sets of data, with more sophisticated uh, political communication tactics and AI leveraged in order to really target people on a more individual level. All of this could seem nefarious or savvy, largely depending on who you trust. I worried a lot about whether or not we were, with our targeting practices, leading people along to a decision that they may have not have made otherwise. And we came to the conclusion that we didn't have to worry about this. I think that was naive. Everyone in the world doesn't think they're persuadable. I'm here to assure you that you are. We weren't thoughtful, we weren't careful, and the last eight years have showed us that we need to be. Former President Barack Obama released the first campaign app in 2008, a mere month before Election Day. Made for the iPhone, which was just released the year before, the app actually had some key similarities to those we see today. The foundation of all of this is purely on the fact that the voter registration data is open data. You're very much able to get access to the data that allows you to target people to vote from the get-go. The app accessed the user's contact list, highlighting friends and family who lived in swing states and encouraging users to call them on behalf of the campaign. GPS was a brand new feature for smartphones back then, and the original Obama app used it to direct users to local events and campaign offices. But then as in now, there's no U.S. law ensuring that data gathered for a specific purpose will only be used for that purpose. All these tiny things, the contact list to send text messages, the location to find rallies, all of these things are collected, centralized, and out of your power how they're used. But users were opting in, and the campaign's tech savvy was lauded. Obama built on this in 2012, using technology in ways that the political world had never seen. The smartphone replaced the clipboard for door-to-door -door campaigning, as Obama's canvassing app gave volunteers lists of neighbors to target. One million people gave the campaign access to their Facebook data and their friends' Facebook data, and Obama's email listserv topped 20 million. Reid wondered just how much the team could ask for. What we found is that people trusted us, you know, for better or for worse, I, I think for better. Um, people trusted us with that data and they, they just said yes to everything. They just hadn't seen how dark it could get. He hadn't either, but the next election cycle, the Cambridge Analytica scandal put a spotlight on the relationship between big data and voter manipulation. Cambridge Analytica drilled deep, looking for a trove of social media data on Americans to help Republican presidential campaigns fine tune their messages and win votes. Through a third-party quiz app, the political consulting and data analysis firm Cambridge Analytica obtained the personal information of tens of millions of Facebook users without their consent. Those who downloaded the app were told their data would be used for academic purposes. But actually, it was used to build out detailed voter profiles for both Ted Cruz and Donald Trump's presidential campaigns. Susceptible voters were then targeted with provocative political content and ads prior to the 2016 election. This was a major breach of trust. And and I'm really sorry that this happened. The truth came out in 2018, and the scope of the data harvesting, combined with the fact that most hadn't opted in and didn't know how their data would be used, angered millions. A movement to delete Facebook started trending, and conversations around data privacy entered the mainstream. All the while, though, campaign apps were getting more sophisticated. Clinton's 2016 app was heavily gamified. Users could compete against each other to earn rewards, you could decorate your digital campaign headquarters, pet a virtual dog, water a virtual plant. It obviously didn't lead to victory, but overall the scandals and successes of the past decade had laid the foundation for a robust, if concerning, digital campaign strategy. 
Built by Funware, the Austin-based mobile software company well known for its advanced location tracking capabilities, the Trump 2020 app truly does it all. It's a gamified outreach tool, news aggregator, media creator, and virtual events platform with a maximalist approach to data collection. If you want to donate money, there's a means to donate money. If you want to tie into a stream of all the social media discussion that's going on, you can do that as well. Maybe you want to man the polls. Maybe you want to go door knocking. Maybe you want to do surveys. The app requires a phone number, full name, email, and zip code to sign up. And then users are asked to share their location info. While Funware doesn't control how the Trump campaign will choose to use this data, Natowski says it's proven extremely useful for targeted advertising in the commercial space. Location-based services are set up so that you can set very small to very large geofences to know when you enter or exit a geofence, what should happen based on the context of who that person is, what their interests are, and how that brand values that customer. So then when you extend these in to the world of politics, it's really no different. It's possible that the Trump campaign could use this information to track users' most sensitive comings and goings. They want to know if you're going to church on Sunday, or if you're going to the shooting range, or if you're going to the abortion clinic. And then once they have that kind of information, they can triangulate that information with other the data points that they have in order to really get you with personalized advertising. Woolley and his research associate, Jacob Gursky, say Trump appears to be taking cues from India Prime Minister Narendra Modi's app. Launched in 2015, Modi's app has been downloaded 10 million times. The default permissions give it nearly total access to all the data on a user's phone, and the app is often used to disseminate news and propaganda to supporters. The Trump app and the Modi app are a piece of a media ecosystem. They are inseparable from this idea that the mainstream media is corrupt. This is your source for real news, not fake news. Users see attention-grabbing articles from the campaign's media team, as well as a curated Twitter stream of pro-Trump content. On the App Store, Trump 2020 is actually categorized as a news app and rated 17 plus for reasons including mild profanity, crude humor, mature themes, and medical treatment information. According to Apptopia, it has over 2.6 million downloads as of early October. That's nearly 15 times more than Biden's campaign app, Vote Joe, which is categorized as a social networking app appropriate for ages four and up. The difference between even the Trump and the Biden campaign is so profound, it's not even funny. That's the difference between building a Ferrari and having a beat up used pickup truck. But the Biden app is a powerful tool in its own right, if more narrow in its approach. While Trump's app is seemingly targeted to all his supporters, Biden's is clearly designed for one purpose, relational organizing. That is, getting volunteers and organizers to strategically reach out to friends and family and vote Biden. It's a, it's a coin with two sides, right? Like the best way to change someone's mind about something that they believe in politically is to talk to them and to know them. But the best way to manipulate someone is also to get someone that they care about to share information with them. Basically, what you think of the strategy could largely depend on the message being peddled. But Woolley and Gursky argue that whenever relational organizing is combined with high volume, semi-automated outreach tools, we should be worried. It changes with scale and it changes with automation. So texting your, your grandmother to say, hey, you should really register to vote is great. But what these politicians are doing, building around it, this automated system that really just turns it into a new form of propaganda. Much like Obama's app, Vojo primarily wants access to users' contacts. Once permission is granted, the app then matches this data with a national voter file, allowing users to filter their friends and family by political affiliation, voting history, and whether or not they live in a battleground state. The app is clear that it will not reach out to these people. It wants you to reach out. After all, that's what research says is most effective. Users earn points and badges by texting contacts and encouraging them to take actions, like registering to vote or watching a debate. Users can mass text as many people as they'd like, using a pre-populated but editable campaign message. They're then encouraged to provide additional info on their contacts, like preferred candidate, voting plan, and interest in volunteering, further building out the campaign's voter files. The app doesn't ask for location data, but Woolley says all these names and numbers can still go a long way in helping campaigns target voters. When that data is triangulated with other streams of data, say from credit reporting agencies or from data downloaded from social media firms, it becomes way more powerful. 
When it comes down to it, so many of the worries surrounding campaign apps are the same ones that advocates and consumers alike have about data privacy, hyper-targeted advertising, and manipulation in the commercial space. There is nothing that's free in the world. <laughs> and you're either the product uh, or you're paying for the right to not be the product. It's a chilling reminder of the way that tech giants and advertisers think about our data. But the consequences could be even more concerning in the political realm. People have gotten really used to this idea that we just give away our data, whether it's we give away our data to Google Maps or to Facebook. The thing that's particularly worrying about political campaigns using applications to gather data is that they're using it for politics. They're using it to, in attempts to kind of game the democratic system. Right now, Democrats are more adept at using tech for relational organizing. But Republicans definitely have the edge when it comes to targeting voters using smartphone location data. They've put Bluetooth beacons and lawn signs to track who passes by and set up geofences around churches to identify mass goers who aren't registered to vote. Trump's former campaign manager, Brad Parscale, has spoken openly about the vast amount of voter data gathered at Trump rallies. While 2018 Senate candidate Beto O'Rourke also identified mobile ID numbers at his rally, so far there are fewer reports of Democrats using this tactic. But some say it's only a matter of time. We're going to be in a 24-7, 365 world where all data and information, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, and endless computing power to know exactly who people really are, not who they say they are, but what they're really going to do because you have endless amounts to predict what they're going to do before they do it. That's the world that we're going to get into. But what if this isn't the world that we want? we need really strict regulation upon both the commercial side and the political side of data gathering. Many say that could look something like the GDPR, Europe's data privacy and security law, which sets strict regulations regarding transparency, consent, and user control over personal data. The idea of having you know, clear rules for consent and saying your data was collected for this and it should be limited to this or you have to be notified that it's being used for something else, that could be adopted, you could imagine, just for the political space. Regular people don't have time on their hands to figure out how much data is being gathered about them, and so we've got to do something more about it.